Have you ever stacked up a whole bunch of limbs? I mean, it takes hours to do it, but in the same way, when you strike a match, it seems like it disappears really fast. That's good for when you're burning rubbish and trash, but what happens when it's your reputation and trust? I'm Dr. Dan Marooks, and I want to welcome you to First Call. It's a unique church filled with extraordinary people. And today we're going to be talking about how do we protect one of the greatest gifts that we give to people, and that is our witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. How do we, how do we protect it from the fire? We're going to be finishing up our six byproducts of a fireproof faith, and we're going to be looking at the last two today. So I'm thrilled to have you with us, and I can't wait for you to join with us in our song of praise. We want to welcome you as we begin tonight, as we begin to first look at God's Word, because we're going to dig deeper about the power of a witness in just a moment. But we're going to open up with our scripture that's found in Revelations chapter 12. It's verses 10 through 11. This is what it says. It's actually up here on the screens if, if you need that. But it says, And then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength and kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come. For the accuser of the brethren, we know who that is, accuser of the brethren who has accused them before our God day and night has been cast down. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, and by the word of their testimony. That word is going to be very, very important tonight as we look at God's word later on. And they did not love their lives to the death. What are we willing to do? What are we willing to be as a witness for the Lord Jesus Christ, even though the times will be hard, situations can be bad, and the problems around us seem to be on fire? Well, there's a difference between a fire that consumes and a fire that refines, and we're going to be looking at that fire tonight. Before we get started, would you please join with me as we pray, and then we're going to jump but into praising the Lord our God with our voices and song. Let's pray together. Father, once more we come before you in this time and in these moments to be able to praise you, to glorify you, and to realize that we have already won the victory. Lord, all we've got to do is walk in it because of the blood of the Lamb that has already been shed to victoriously cover the sins of our life. And Lord, the testimony by which we have now, the words that we say, the life that we live, will now be the very example of that which we believe. Father, it is my prayer that in this night we will wholeheartedly say, Lord Jesus, I believe in you. Father, help us to be able to seek your face. And Lord, help us as we worship you by lifting up our voices in song. This I pray in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and all of God's people said. Amen and amen. Let's all stand together and let's sing God's praises.
is a new one. So I'll sing the verse through the first time, and then you guys can join me and we'll sing the verse a second. when we come before you realizing that you have been given a name that is above every name. That at the name of Jesus Christ, every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess. It's on heaven, on earth, and below the earth. What will they confess? Father, they will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of you, Father. Lord, songs like that remind us that we are not defeated saints. We are victorious in everything we do because you have already given us the victory. And what we do with that will be our decision in our life. Whether we will walk timidly and fearfully through this world. Or will we walk with the boldness of the light of Judah. And push the darkness back that seems to want to permeate the places that we hold dear. Our communities, our cities, our homes, and even our churches. Oh God, 
Help your saints to burn. Burn bright so it continues to push back the darkness of sin so that the light of your grace and your glory will be felt once again. Father, let us be still as we seek you now. Let us be humble as we bow before you. Let us stand in awe and wonder of who you are. Jesus, only Jesus. Father, thank you. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. I want to welcome you here as we begin to start looking at uh, not just the power of what God does in our life, but as we start to begin to join together, knowing that it's been a long season, 10 weeks plus, of having to be there and here and stuff, but to be able to slowly start coming back into God's house and to being around God's people. It is a joy that I have, not only in my heart, but to be able to connect and to share and to praise and to pray with the saints of Almighty God. Welcome. Welcome for those of you who are here. One of the uh, slides that you see behind me as we begin in our... Uh, our thought for today is the fact that uh, right behind my house, I had uh, uh, what is called a burn pile. Anybody have a burn pile somewhere? You know, in the, in the country, we have those. You can't have those in the city. Well, you can't, but they're illegal. But what I did is you know, I, I got a new toy uh, really almost about a year ago. and never really had a chance to play with it much because it, it wasn't quite the time for it. But I finally got it. It's one of those great big long pole saws. You know the ones that you have the battery? and you Because anything that makes a noise, a man just loves. It just, it's just good. And so I got that out probably about four and a half weeks ago. Got that out, got everything set in because it was finally time to start cutting down some of the old stuff around our house. Now, I want you to know, as I began in that process, it was just going to be one tree. You know, you, know, you started out with the idea of, I'm, I'm just going to trim back a couple of limbs here and just a couple of limbs there. Well, it starts out there, and you're like, you know, well, that tree needs some trim. Well, you know that tree over there? You know, there's a tree in the front that really looks bad. And, and so all around our house, all around my mom and dad's house, I was cutting down limbs. I was having... A ball until I needed to clean it up you know it's easy to cut stuff down it's a lot harder once you now start dragging it and having to put it to a place so in the midst of what you see in that picture that is almost four and a half hours worth of work and that's just the first pile got it started got it there but you know what's so amazing about a pile like that is that it may have taken four some odd hours to get it that way. But once you strike a match to it, it only takes about seven to ten minutes for all of it to be gone. That's, now that's great when you're trying to get rid of rubbish and trash. But what happens when that fire starts to consume a reputation and our trust? Because it can take years to build up a reputation and only seconds to lose it. Because of decisions that we make, because of circumstances that we find ourselves in, because of compromises we make in our life, we can begin to start sliding down that slippery slope. And all oh, in the midst of everything is that all of our life is now consumed by a fire that now devastates everything. But my question as we go into our study in Daniel chapter 3 is how do we safeguard our reputation? How do we safeguard our witnesses, which is one of the greatest gifts that we give to people around us through the Lord Jesus Christ, how do we keep that from being consumed in the fire of this world? It's to make sure that we make a fireproof faith in our life. And that's what we're going to be looking at as we finish in our study of Daniel chapter 3. Here's what I'd like for you to do is I want you to take your Bibles and I want you to go ahead and turn to Daniel chapter 3. We're going to look at verses 24 and 25 to kind of bring us back up to where we are. Now, we're looking at the six byproducts of a fireproof faith. Now, what I mean by the six byproducts, tonight is the last two. We've gone through the last four uh, over the last couple of weeks, and I want to kind of do a quick review for, for those that are with us and also those that may be joining with us. But in the, the book of Daniel chapter 3, we see three very powerful young men, Shadrach, Meshach, 
in a minute ago. They're there, and they're now put into a place by which they have to allow God to be God. Now, that's something we're going to talk about in just a few moments. But Nebuchadnezzar, the great king that he was, prideful, arrogant, maniacal, everything else, had set up the golden image, you know that, and now had commanded that everyone needed to bow down. He wanted to unify his entire kingdom by making people worship one idol. See, that's what sometimes tyrants try to do. They can't get everything together governmentally-wise, so they're going to try to get everybody together religious-wise. It's sort of a one-world government, one-world religion. Where have we heard that one also before? And we see that in the book of Revelations. But he's trying to do that, and the simple part is when the music starts, everyone bows or else you burn. Everyone went down except for three, and on the landscape, they stood out like a sore thumb. But you know what? Isn't that what God calls us to do? To stand out, to be a peculiar people? But what they began to teach us as we start looking at their lives is what does it mean to have a witness that helps to exemplify a fireproof faith. And the byproduct from that, the first byproduct that they had taught us was one to have a resolved faith. Now, what does that mean? A resolved faith simply means that they've trusted to be God and allow God to be God who he is. And they had made that decision already firm within their life. There wasn't a decision made at the moment where they needed to. It was already made before they needed to get there. They knew that they would not do anything that would defile themselves or defile their witness before Almighty God. That was the resolve by which they had. But a second byproduct that we talked about was called a refuting faith. Now, what does the refuting faith mean? When a person of conviction, when a person of character stands up like a light, it simply starts to expose everybody else's weaknesses that want to live in the dark. I liken it into turning on the light in the kitchen in the middle of the night and seeing a lot of things scurry that you don't really want to see. That's what the light of people's convictions do. Matter of fact, that's what's happening in the world. That's why the world hates the church. Because the church is a light that begins to be that, that resonating presence that when they start, all the dark corners start to be exposed and people don't like what they do in the dark to be exposed in the light. So it's a refuting faith. A third byproduct of that fireproof faith is called a relinquishing faith. I love these three words that these three incredible saints teach us. These three words are this, but if not. That relinquishing faith says, we want God's will done, not ours. We have our way, we have our plans, we have our ideas, <laughs> but ultimately it's God's will that we're seeking. Because they knew God could save them from the fire, He could save them in the fire, or He could save them by the fire. Usually that last one we don't like because that's the ultimate healing in our life. My friends, as a child of God, and I I've shared this in reference to cancer in life. God can heal us temporarily or God can heal us eternally. Either way, we have been healed. That is a relinquishing faith. But then there's also byproduct number four, which is a refocusing faith. And this is where we pick back up again as we read these next two verses. Why? Because the refocusing faith is this is that when a child of God, not just with a light that exposes the things that are around us, but it helps people to be able to start seeing who's in us. Or in this case, who's standing beside us. Because my friends, remember, you plus God is always the majority. Doesn't matter how much that the enemy has, you plus God always win. And that's where we begin again tonight as we look at the last two byproducts of a fireproof faith. If you would, if you can, please join with me and stand in the honor of the reading of God's Word. Then in Daniel chapter 3, verses 24 and 25, as we use this as a springboard to go into our last byproducts. <laughs> Man, I love these verses right here. Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished and he rose in haste and spoke, saying to his counselors, Did we not cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? And they answered and said to the king, True, O king, look, he answered, I see four men loose, walking in the midst of the fire. They are not hurt, and the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. My friends, as we go into tonight, 
we're going to realize that the greatest witness we can ever have is not what we do, but what God has already done through us. And when we let God be God, He provides us the insulation in the midst of the fires and the strength to stand in the flames and say how good our God is. Before we go into these last two byproducts, let's go before that throne of grace one more time. Father, again, we thank you, we love you, and we praise you. And Lord, I pray that in the moments by which you provide for us, Lord, that we will allow the schedules to scream, the, the calendars that call, all of the busyness that keeps us, Father, uh, doing instead of just being. And Lord, help us to be like, like Mary. Let us sit at your feet. Let us glean from your words. And let us be strengthened in our walk. Father, we have come here to see Jesus and him only. And it's in that precious and holy name that I pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. You know, when we have gone through a, a tremendous tempest in our life, uh, we begin to start growing in an understanding not only of who God is, his character, but of what God does. That's his conduct. His conduct is holiness. And when we walk through the fire, we begin to start realizing how much we need to lean on him as well as learn from him. And that's where we start going into the fifth byproduct of a fireproof faith. And that's found in verses 26 through 27 of Daniel chapter 3. And this byproduct is called the refined faith. Refined, it means that it is taken to the place to where all of the dross is now burned out. And that which is pure is now left. Let me read the verses here, starting in verse number 26. Then Nebuchadnezzar went near the mouth of the burning fiery furnace evidently it wasn't as hot as it was when it got started and spoke saying Shadrach Meshach and Abednego servants of the most high God come out come out and come here then Shadrach Meshach and Abednego came from the midst of the fire and the sand traps the administrators the governors the king's counselors gathered together and they saw these men on whose bodies the fire had no power. The hair of their head was not singed, nor were their garments affected by the smell of fire. It was not on them. Let me go back to verse number 26 because we're going to start looking at some of the things that we can glean or in a sense that we can literally pull from this refining process to be able to see what are the true nuggets of gold that come within our life when we are tested and tried and refined as God's pure gold. Number one is that the world may bind us with its feathers of hate and of fear, but God's holy heat is what burns that away and sets us free to walk in the faith in him. Think about that. A, when Nebuchadnezzar is now looking within the fire, he's not only seeing the three, he's seeing the four. But what is he seeing? Them? He says, I see them walking around loosed. That means all of the stuff that was binding around them is now falling off. Beth Moore says this in her book. She says, the refining fire of God destroys only that which holds us back. Now here's where we began to start having sometimes some, some situations with that because the stuff that God wants to take away from us, we want to hold on to. It's like a, a, a one-year-old when you want to give them a toy and when you want to take that toy back. I have never seen something that has such a death grip as a young child holding on to a toy. But when we can look at a toy, that, a, a toy that's being held on by a child, what are some of the things that seem to hold us back because we're holding on to it? There was a movie that came out some time back called Commander, uh, Commander in Chief. It was uh, Russell Crowe had done. He was a commander of a, of a ship, and they were out, and they were trying to find a, a, an enemy ship itself. But in the midst of a really, really bad time, they were starting to have uh, no wind. They were there, and there was a, a young man that they began to blame, saying, you know, the, the curse of Jonah is on him. The, uh, the curse of, of, of a situation, but all these things are happening. And so this man became so uh, depressed and everything else that, that he simply went to the edge of the ship 
And he talked to one of his young men and he says, listen, I'm, I'm so thankful of our friendship. You've been always so good to me. And the little kid that was kind of there says, well, why are you angry? And then he, the other guy just took a, a, a cannonball and he went to the edge of the ship and he jumped off the ship. And there he disappeared underneath the water holding on to that weight. That, that scene continues to permeate me because that's what our own sin does to us is it starts dragging us down. But you know, the only thing he needed to do, let go of it. Let go of it. And he would have come back up to the surface. When Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were thrown into the fire, they were bound by the world. What are the fetters that wrap around us? What are the things that seem to entrap us? What are the things that seem to pull us down. That's exactly what God says, I want to take away. I want to burn away. I want to refine you in your life. But not only does God refine us from the fetters of the world, he also reminds us that we don't have to live the false names that the world gives us. Now, how many of you know the actual names of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? <laughs> you know what, growing up as a kid, we know Daniel, because that's the book. And Belshazzar, you know, he, that, that was his name. But we, we know Daniel, but Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, we, we have songs about them. But we have songs singing about the names that the king of Babylonian gave them. Not the ones that God gave them. You see, here's the truth of that. The world will always give us their names. They will always call us some things besides our names. When I went to basic training in 1987 at Fort Jackson, South Carolina, it was a place called the Land of Soldiers. When I was greeted, they said, we're going to make you a soldier. We're going to kill you in the process. My drill sergeant, Drill Sergeant Thompson, called me everything but my name. The world's going to call us a lot of different things. But let me go back to the names itself. Because Daniel... Though he was called Belshazzar, which means, oh, Baal protected life, his name was Daniel, which simply means God is my judge. Hananiah, which is Shadrach, that was changed to that. Shadrach being commanded by Aku, Hananiah simply says, the Lord is gracious. You see, there's always going to be a little twist. The world's going to use a little bit to try to twist it into its own making. Mishael was Meshach. Meshach representing who is Aku is, whereas Mishael simply says this, who is what God is. And the last one, Azariah, who is called Abednego, which means servant of Nebo, which was the second ranking God in the Babylonian pantheon. Azariah simply means this, the Lord will help. Here's my question for us. What name do we live when we are surrounded by the fires of our situations of life? Sometimes the situations that we've created and sometimes the situations that are just wrapped around us that are beyond our control. Do we live the world's name, the world's description of us? Or do we live the name that God has given us? I like Daniel's name because it says the Lord God is my judge. As a child of God, I know that he has judged me and because of the blood of his son Jesus Christ, I know that I have been washed white as snow. And the judgment of sin is no longer on me because of the price that Christ paid on the cross. But my friends, here's what I mean when I live a life in the, the name by which I begin to start living under. I have asked the Lord Jesus Christ to be my Lord and my Savior, to be king of my life. Here's what happens when I sin. Here's what happens when I try to do it my way. This is what I say to God. I don't want you to be king. I want to be king. I don't want to live your name. I want to live my name. My friends, I'm here to tell you, the witness of these three young men remind us that as we are refined in the process of this world, God says, I've given you a name to live, and I want you to live my name because it is the name that is above all names. But there's one other last thing, and it's actually found in verse number 27. Talks about the fragrance of the world 
The fragrance of the world is rot and sin. That is the smoke that permeates. One thing about my fire department is I began to talk with many of our uh, men and women that, that serve so ferociously to protect our, our communities and our homes and rushing into the uh, houses that are on fires and the different types of smokes that are there. And some are gas and some are oil and some are all kind of other stuff. They know the type of fire is they're engaging it because of the smell of the smoke that they're, that, that they're beginning to hear. But you know what? That stuff permeates. That stuff gets into the, uh, the, 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 uh, the clothes and the skin and everything else. The smell of smoke hangs around. When I came back from my deployment to Sinai, Egypt, over seven and a half months, I ate the food of Egyptian um, spices, one of them being curry. And the thing about curry, it's, it's really, it's, it's a great spice. But after about seven and a half months of it, your body reeks of curry. I didn't know that until I got home because by that time I had just gotten used to it. But not Arion, not Erica. And at that time, you know, growing up, not, not really Allison either. Because it took almost two and a half months, I would say almost two and a half months, to get it out of me, get it out of my system because it came through my pores. My friends, sin comes through our pores the longer we're in it. Like that smoke that starts to wrap around us. When they came out of the fire, here's what all of those that were watching. Now, they were in amazement. They were in amazement, number one, that they were still walking around in the fire itself. But when King and Nebuchadnezzar called them out, notice he didn't call the fourth one out. I don't think he wanted to tangle with the one that was sitting in there. That, that always struck me as funny when he said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God. He probably looked over the other one. He says, I need you guys to come out. When they came out, I believe them, like us, would simply expect this. <laughs> They're going to smell like smoke. And what does it say in scriptures? Not a hair of their head was singed now that's an interesting odor because I've had that before. Yeah, it's, it's, it's called a bonfire with, um, when you're trying to make s'mores. And you have kids around you. And they have the little marshmallows that they stick in the thing. And here's what happens. When one catches on fire, fireball! And they swing it around and they don't see the adult sitting next to them. As one hit me right in the back of the head. And now a flaming marshmallow is now stuck to the side of my head. It wasn't stuck there very long. But the smell at that time was just the burnt hair and stuff like that. No s'mores for me that night. But there was nothing. Their hair was not even singed, nor was their garments affected. Here it is. And the smell of fire was not on them. There's a passage in Jude about how we pull people from the fire and how we remind them that we want to grab them from the fire so that the very garments that they have will not smell like smoke. God says when we walk in the midst of the fire, the only fragrance that will come upon us as we step in the midst of the people around us will be the fragrance of grace of God all over us. That is the refining process of a fireproof faith. But that's where it begins to help us to realize that if we start moving in that, that way, when we start looking at all the other byproducts, what is the last byproduct that we see in faith and it's found in verses 28 through 29? And this is the rejoicing faith. You see, a refined faith means that we have gone through the process and we have come out refined in the very presence of God. My friends, that's time for rejoicing at that moment. Verse 28, it says, Nebuchadnezzar spoke saying, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who sent his angel and delivered his servants who trusted in him, and they have frustrated the king's word and yielded their bodies that they should not serve nor worship any god except their own god. Verse 25. Therefore, I make a decree 
that any people, nation, or language which speaks anything amiss against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be cut into pieces, and their houses shall be made into an ash heap, because there is no other God who can deliver like this. <laughs> Isn't it amazing that the very king that says, and what God will save you from my hand, is now praising the very God that did. And what is the part about the rejoicing at that moment? Well, we can see from here of how, what I call my takeaways in the rejoicing moments of this fire encounter. Number one, it is an example by the fact that in the past, we now have those that exemplify a model of what it means to walk by faith, even in the fire. To see within scriptures that tell us that those that are willing to go through the world and to go through the world win and to go through the very fire itself and trust God for whatever it was, that's a witness that I need in my life. That's a witness that every single one of us need for life. Because whatever fire that we go through in life, whether it's health or finances or situations or, or problems or pandemics or protests, it doesn't matter. God is still God. We have examples that we can pull from. In Revelations, we, we read it earlier because we overcome the enemy by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of our testimony. The witness by which we have Hebrews chapter 11, happen, uh, chapter 12 tells us of those that are willing to be those witnesses. But that's good for the past. What about for the present? Well, there's a present determination right now that when we are about to go into the situations in our life that we have to proactively plan what's about to happen. And what does that mean? That means that we prepare for when the fire comes. When do you prepare for a hurricane? Now, we're, we're starting to get ready to go into that hurricane season. And all of these things start coming out and things that you got to do and preparations that we're sending out and what you need to make sure you take care of. Let me ask you this. When do you prepare for a hurricane? Is it when it comes on and says hurricane will be here in about an hour? Mm. If you do that, you are like really, really pushing your luck. My friends, we start preparing for the hurricane long before it gets here. Because we want to be ready for when it does. One of the things that I, that I try to live in my life is in an area of determination, of preparation, is this. It is better to prepare and prevent rather than repair and repent. That means I'm going to do, I'm going to make that determination early and I'm going to do everything I can to make sure that I'm ready for it. My friends, in Genesis when God told Cain, sin is crouching at your door. When Jesus told Peter, Peter, Satan wants to sift you like wheat. What would he say to us? Dan, when you start going down this road, there's going to be an issue not too far from you. You're going to have to decide, are you going to drive like a Christian or are you going to drive like somebody else? We all make those decisions. But we don't make the decisions in the midst of the storm. We make them before the storm hits. On June the 6th, 1944, there was a storm. Storm was called Normandy. It was a D-Day invasion. It was Operation Overlord. It had been planned and prepared. Everything was put into place. And the time kept getting pushed back because of the weather and things of that nature. But finally, Eisenhower, the commander of the Allied forces, made the decision. It said, go. Go. He said that what you're about to do is almost too large of a feat. And we, we're going to ask Almighty God to give us strength. In the midst of World War II, over 6 million men were a part of that. Now over 4% of those are still alive in our nation today. 
But when they were about to engage, when they were about to hit the beaches of Utah, of Sword, of, of all of the surrounding earth, Point to Hawk, things that they were coming in, the Arab War operations that were flying over, everything that was happening in the midst of what they were going into, those that were on the ship were now about to go into the beach, and what they were stepping into was hell itself. They were stepping into the fire of bullets, of artillery, of mortars, of everything imaginable, yet they continued to press forward because of what they were doing was going to be more successful because of the liberty by which they lived, because that was going to be the turning point of the world. Not just of the war, of the world. Over 4,000 died that day within just a matter of hours. Over 9,000 were wounded, many of them seriously wounded. And by the end of the day, over 200,000 German troops were captured. It was the beginning of the end. But what would have happened if they were not willing to face the fire? What would have happened if they just wanted to stay on the safety of the ships? Well, they would have become as sitting ducks. When I was going through some of my study about that incredible day, I came across <laughs> some soldiers and some of their quotes. One of them is a Private Claire Galdonik. And his words were this, the waiting for history to be made was the most difficult. I spent much time in prayer, <laughs> being cooped up, made it all the worse. Like everybody else on this stupid ship, I was seasick, and I was just ready to get off regardless. Private First Class Joe Leninsky says this, I don't feel that I'm any kind of hero. To me, the work had to be done. I asked to do it. And so I did. And when I lecture kids, I tell them the same thing. Another one, Staff Sergeant Frank Sabalski. He says, the first time I saw a poster wanting men to sign up to be paratroopers, and I heard how hard it would be for anyone to just make it, he said, I knew that was for me. I wanted an elite group of soldiers to be around me. Now, I'm going to go back to what he said in just a moment in closing. But let me give you their names. Galdonik, Lenzinikski, and Soblowski. Reminds me a lot of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Hard names to pronounce. But great men to be admired. I love what Staff Sergeant Zablowski said. It wasn't just about being in the paratroopers. It was about being surrounded by the elite people who were being trained. Those that had already been tempered by the fire and they were ready to fight. He knew that in his mind that those that had gone through the exact same training would not run the other way, but they would run toward the very far. They would run toward the enemy. They would run toward and make sure that each and every one of them were protected because they were warriors wanting victory. They, were, they didn't come there to die. They came there to win. What would happen to the church of Jesus Christ if we started living like that? Instead of becoming comfortable in the complacency of where we are, we begin to start running toward the battle line. But here's the difference. We've already won. We've, we've already got the victory. And all we have to do is just trust God in the process of it. When God walks with us, it doesn't matter about the fire that is around us. It matters about the fire of faith that's inside of us. And my friends, that fire of faith will consume anything else around us that is not of God. I don't know about you, but I need a fireproof faith 
that is going to allow me to walk in the midst of the situations that I'm still yet to encounter. But then also trust that wherever I go, God's already encountered it for me and I don't have to worry about it. God is gonna give us what we need to be the men and women that he has called us to be because as warriors of light, we will call upon his word to light our way. Are you ready to be surrounded by the elite? By the extraordinary people that fill this place? I am. Because when his name is shared, his glory is felt. Let's pray. Father, I ask now that as we prepare for a moment to where we take in your word and we begin to reflect upon it and Father, glean from it. Father, let us not live anymore a lip service type of life. Saying that, yes, I'm, I'm a Christian, but we're very superficial. The time of cowardly Christianity is gone. Of superficial sainthood is now dissolved. Father, who we now need to be are men and women that are totally committed in serving and seeking you. So Father, now touch us as we sing, but most importantly, as we learn. Learning to live, to lean upon you in a name that is above every name, a name that is beautiful, which is Jesus, our Lord. And it's in that precious name that I pray. Amen. Let's all stand together as we sing our hymn of invitation. we leave out in this night, I want to thank you for coming and being a part as we begin to start slowly building the classes, slowly start building the services, slowly start building the outreach. And everything that God's called us to be, live the name that is above all names, the name that is wonderful. Because when we do that, the world sees the wonderful name and thus, let's pray as we dismiss. God, thank you for this night. Thank you for this time. Thank you for this day. Thank you for these moments that we call upon you and ask more than anything else that you will go before us, that you will go with us, that you will completely cover us and keep us safe in the grip of your grace. This I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you as you go into this day. Hey, let me ask you this as we get ready to close out. In a world that seems to be on fire, how fire retardant is your reputation? That will depend on who's actually guarding it. When we went through God's Word, I talked about with the children of God, we have no problem because God insulates us in the midst of the fire. But my question for those of you that are watching online, do you know the Lord Jesus Christ that covers you with His grace? 
because that's the only way to make sure that you are fire repellent, not just the things of the world, the things that come through the world. If you want more answers to your questions about your fireproof faith, why don't you give me a call at 813-767-2082. That's my cell phone. Or you can reach out to us on our website at firstcallsbc.com. I'd love to hear from you, and I'd sure love to talk to you about what it means to have a fireproof faith with our Heavenly Father. Thank you for joining us. I look forward to seeing you next week.